It's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you today? Awesome. Well, we are up and at it, ready to go because Breck is on his way over here. He's going to hang out today. What we're actually going to do is uh, a few years ago, I can't even remember how long ago it was, I was in a movie, I was in a Christmas movie, and the guy who directed the movie, um, I really became a big fan of his work. I thought he did a great job writing and directing the movie. And um, and Breck and Michael and I forget who else. I think Kevin. I think all four of us went to see the movie when it came out. And um, we all thought it was a great movie. Well, they made a follow-up. Not a continuation of the movie, but they made a another movie. He made another movie. And um, for some reason, I wasn't asked to be in it. I don't know why. But... Um, it hit theaters today, and based on how it does this um, this coming weekend that it's out is how what determines whether it'll be in theaters after this. So we're actually going to go and see that movie, and we're going to show you the title. Hopefully it's somewhere near, and you guys can go check it out if you'd like to. But we're also going to hit a cemetery along the way. Um, there is somebody buried up there in the same cemetery that Karen Carpenter is buried in that we vlogged once before. And um, I'm a big fan of this person's music, and I figured, you know, that'd be a perfect thing to vlog along the way. So as soon as Brett gets here, we will head out of here, go see the movie, and go visit the great Harry Nilsson. Are you happy that your buddy Brooks here now? You're freaking out waiting for him to show up. Freaking yeah. out. It's supposed to say, I love LA, but the heart's kind of faded out. There's the Hollywood cross up there. I vlogged that, that's got an interesting story. There's the Invasion of the Body Snatchers bridge above us. Wow, look at all the green hills. You know where the fires will be next summer. This is actually where the fires, this was the area the fires were in recently. Here it is, Pierce Brothers Valley Oaks. Looks like Breck has found it. Well, here he is. The grave of the great Harry Nilsson. The man that the Beatles called their favorite rock group. The man they said that should run for president. Harry Nilsson for president. Now Harry lived out a troubled childhood and that would end up following him throughout his entire life and would be one of the main reasons that he and John Lennon would become such great friends. See, see Harry's father left home when he was a young kid and he ended up having to go live with his aunt and uncle. He had to get a job at a very early age and one day when he quit that job he came home and told them that he had quit and his aunt and uncle said we don't think we can afford to keep you here then. So at the age of 15 years old, he took off and was on his own ever since. Now you'd think with such a harsh life to start out with, he'd become a bum. Not necessarily. Decided then from there to take off and go to Los Angeles. He came out here, started attending college, and, um, and then quit because he got a job at the Paramount Theater. When the Paramount Theater eventually closed in 1960, he got a job across the street. There was a bank there and he ended up, he had been a manager at the theater, so he went over there and became a manager of their, basically like their computer room, um, handling uh, calls and everything like that. And he would start writing songs from there. You see, Harry was never formally trained in any instrument or anything like that, but in his time working at the Paramount Theater, different acts that would come through would show him different chords and he would start learning instruments on his own, start writing songs. And Harry Nilsson was always known as being one of the greatest voices of his time. In fact, some say he was the greatest voice of his time. Now I actually became a Harry Nilsson fan when I was a really young kid. 
before I even knew I was a Harry Nilsson fan. And it's actually what got him out of working at the bank. He was writing songs, he had went in to an office of uh, a publishing company, they liked the songs that he played for them, and they gave him a publishing deal, but it wasn't enough being $50 a week for him to quit the job until the Monkees were gonna record their album Headquarters. And he came in with a song that he had written called Cuddly Toy, which has always been a favorite of mine. I never actually knew it was a Harry Nilsson song until recently. He played it and Davy Jones said, yeah, I'll record that song. And when they left the studio that day, Harry Nilsson's um, publishing partner said, Harry, you can quit the bank. Now Harry would eventually get to record his first album. And like I said, this guy's voice was amazing. He had one of the greatest voices of all time and also had some of the greatest songs to match it. Ironically though, a lot of the songs that he had hits with were not songs that he wrote. And some of the songs that he did have hits with um, that he did write, other people had recorded, including you know the song One is the Loneliest Number, but he also had recorded the song that became known for Midnight Cowboy, um, Everybody's Talking. That was not even a song that they intended on being the theme song for that movie. What ended up happening was that was a song that Harry recorded and was on his album, and when they started editing the movie, they hadn't had um, a selection picked yet. They had had three or four different major artists um, commissioned to write songs for the movie, including Diana Ross, but um, they had been using Harry's song, Everybody's Talking, as kind of their blueprint as they edited, and they ended up liking it so much they just stuck with it, and it became such a big hit that Harry won a Grammy Award for it. Harry also had hits with the Famous song, Put the Lime in the Coconut, Without You, You're Breaking My Heart, Tearing It Apart, So F You, all kinds of great memorable songs. And like I said, the Beatles were huge fans. When they came to America and they started doing interviews when Harry's first album came out, they started telling everyone that Nilsson was their favorite band. John Lennon himself called Harry Nilsson and said, you know, I'm a huge fan of you. Uh, a couple of days later, Paul McCartney called Harry Nilsson, said the same thing, and Harry said, I kind of got cocky and thought, well, in a day or two, Ringo's going to call and say the same thing. But Ringo never called, but he said, I forgive him because he was the best man at my wedding. Now, Harry became famous for his um, outside the music behavior as well as his songwriting and his recording. He became known as a guy who would do anything for a good time, a guy who was hell-bent on having a good time, and in fact, they said his friendship with John Lennon was a, a friendship made in hell. Um, one of the most famous uh, stories about their friendship um, was the night at the Troubadour, the famous Lost Weekend, where John Lennon said that was when um, Harry Nilsson introduced him to Brandy Alexanders and they went to the Troubadour to see the Smothers Brothers uh, reunion, their comeback, and Harry lied to John and said, hey, they perform better if we heckle them. So every time there was a break, any time that the uh, Smothers Brothers would have anything that they were going to say, any kind of banter in between, um, the timing would totally be killed because John or Harry Nilsson would blurt out something and eventually it ended up breaking out into like a brawl and both of them were kicked out of the Troubadour that night. Now Harry eventually developed polyps in his throat and they thought that his career was going to be in major jeopardy and even Mickey Dolan said um, the guy was like coughing up blood and would even tell me that he, he would find blood on the, um, the windscreen of his microphone and even at that Mickey said I would take him to the hospital and then Harry would want me to sneak him in brandy and cigarettes. But um, one of the weird stories about Harry Nilsson is that for someone who was like almost hell-bent on destroying themselves, it wasn't him who ended up dying in his London apartment, it was two other famous rock stars. They say that his, his flat in London is cursed because both Keith Moon and Mama Cass were both found dead in his apartment. So because of Harry's lack of having a family in his early life, that kind of uh, dovetailed into his later life. And John Lennon had the same problem, so that's kind of what would lead them to become such fast friends and why they would push each other almost like brothers to um, just act as crazy and be as crazy as possible. Now, Harry um, unfortunately would um, first have a marriage that would fail, 
and that would cause him to go into a deep depression writing some of his best songs but then had a uh, second wife where he had many kids and uh, seemed to be a pretty happy life unfortunately though this man with this great voice and this great talent really only produced music for about a 10 year span he ended up dying in 1994 of heart failure he had had a heart attack um, not too long before that but he hadn't made music in about 15 years before that and um, was working on an album and it just finished laying down tracks when he um, unfortunately passed away and like I said in 1994 right up here in Agora Hills California Nilsson Schmilson Harry Nilsson will never be forgotten he did a really great album of standards, but I think if you listen to his first two records, I think you really, really get a taste of that brilliance that Harry possessed in him. Rest in peace, Harry. And actually his good friend John Lennon produced one of his albums called Pussycat. All right, Breck, so we found Harry Nilsson. That was mainly what I wanted to do here. Now I want to go to the movie theater because um, remember when I made Christmas with the Karunsis? Mm -hmm. The director and writer of that has a movie in theaters now and we're going to go see it. Perfect. Let's go see it. Let's go. All right, now we're heading out of Westlake Village and heading on to Thousand Oaks. There it is, the Oaks. Looks like it's in here. All right, there's our AMC. Never been to this one before. Well, since they have some Girl Scout cookies, I guess we'll buy some Girl Scout cookies before we go in. All right, we put all my uh, Girl Scout cookies away and we are gonna head in and watch the movie now. So Breck, it turns out we're here a lot earlier than we thought we were, doesn't it? Yeah, apparently we're really, really, really early. How, how early are we? Uh, about a week. Yeah, I accidentally didn't notice that it starts on the 15th and not this weekend. So, uh, how about I take you out to get some food? Sounds good. All right, let's do that instead. So, it looks like we'll come to Buca de Beppo. They have one here. Why not? Brock, you've been to Buca de Beppo before, haven't you? I have. Really good food. They always have really great decorations here, so... Probably gonna be waiting a little while, but I see Joe DiMaggio in there and I see Sophia Loren. All right, great stuff to look at. And uh, there's our booth. Since I ruined Brooks' day by uh, <laughs> by getting the, the wrong date, we're, we're here eating some food. We ordered some food anyway. Got us a uh, pizza to share and then we're trying out their, uh, they have like a, just a limited time shrimp scampi thing. So we're gonna try that out. Enough food for six people, there's two of us, so we'll, Take care of it. All right, shrimp scampi came out first. It was pretty good. Well, it looked better before Breck started stirring it all up. But... And there's our pizza, the Supremo Italiano. Said it was the best one here. So when I mentioned to Breck that I was gonna bring him here, he said that he had come to a party at a Buco de Beppo before and that they'd had the party in the Pope room and wondered if that was just at that location or if it was at all of them. And I said, no, I think it's at all of them. So as I'm walking, looking around, I found it. Oh, that's a great statue. Check that out. How was it, Breck? It looks like we finished it, but we, we didn't. They're actually boxing the rest of it up for us. We wimped out. All right, we're out of here. Nice melons. Now for the long drive home to see the Joster. Now we're headed off to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. I'm kidding. What a beautiful view. As we're rolling back into Hollywood, if you look up there in the sky, right up here, you can see that light. That's the Hollywood cross that we looked at on our way out of town. What you doing? Sitting on Breck? All right, my friends, we're gonna call it a night. Sorry about that fiasco going to the movie. I even looked at the date and it still didn't register that we were there on the wrong date until they told us. Bummer. But Breck was a good sport about it. I want to send out some shout outs to Peter Angelopoulos, Gregory Aguirre, 
Jana Dubner and Scotty Burnett for making contributions to my channel. Thank you all for watching. We will see you all tomorrow. Have a great night and goodbye.